underground should have. And Clause 13 already had fairly extensive requirements of fire protection, but they've been made more extensive and to cover all plant, including higher plant. The other thing that we have tightened up on is dust control. Clause 15 requires a ventilation clause and requires more rigorous control of dust, particularly in sprayed concrete lining work, where extraction ventilation is to be the preferred method of doing the dust control. Clause 16 will also deal with dust control, and we're now re recommending that dust control should be based on short-term, 50-minute limit, real-time monitoring. The days of the eight-hour sample have gone. They really are meaningless. It takes days and days after the sample's been taken to get the results. So dust control should now be based on 50-minute, short-term, real-time monitoring limits. The control should be sufficient that no one apart from the nozzle operator, no one out by the, the, the spraying robot should be required to wear protective equipment. The control of dust should be by ventilation and not by respiratory protective equipment. And when we're on particulates, we're also adding in a requirement on diesel particulate monitoring, again in real time, and again there are limits to be set on particulate levels for exposure to diesel particulates. Clause 20 is the clause in shafts, and that has been vastly extended in scope. Uh, the days of having shafts are either caissons or sunk by underpinning have gone. We now have D-wall shafts, we've got piled shafts, we've got rectangular shafts, we've got square shafts, we've got lots of different types of shafts. So the guidance in shafts has been comprehensively extended. Clause 23 has been changed slightly to cover all materials handling systems and particularly embracing things like conveyor technology, which is now growing in, in use. 24 is a clause on plant and equipment. We're requiring cabs on all machines for operator protection where they're exposed to excessive levels of dust or heat or noise or vibration. Cabs are not just there to keep the, the operator dry in, in, in rain on the surface. Cabs are there for other occupational health reasons. There's guidance in cleaning concrete pump lines using water and not compressed air. There have been a number of incidents in the UK in recent years where people have been badly injured by d d disconnecting the pump line when it's still pressurised with air. We've been lucky to avoid fatalities on a couple of occasions. There's guidance on lithium-powered batteries for underground vehicles. There's guidance on the use of, of mobile elevating work platforms underground. And this has been done in conjunction with IPAF, the International Powered Access Federation, and they support the changes that we have put forward. And finally, Clause 25, the electrical clause. A number of contractors, electrical engineers, have come together and have significantly rewritten Clause 25. More rigorous requirements for site installations, for the management and design of site installations, and the cabling and the equipment used underground. A very quick outline of the changes. But as I say, please go to the Standards Development Pro Portal and you can download the access to this, the draft standard and you have until the 25th of April to send in your comments. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you. The, 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 the website or 
somehow we'll, I'll, I'll send out a link to the standards portal well, so people can... What, what we'll do, Don, or bear in mind we've managed to lose the slides, is I'll send it, we'll send it out, to, if, if it's acceptable to you, send it out to all members, yeah, the slides even just the, Even just the, the, the web links to the portal will be enough. We'll, we'll, we'll notify tomorrow. Thank you, Donald. So on, on to the, uh, the main talk of the evening. Um, we have uh, Ken McGregor of Barhale and Paul Dennison of Seven Trent. They felt that they needed no introduction, so uh, the names only. The, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello, so good evening everyone. Um, really pleased to see we've got a good turnout and we're being streamed live, which we only found out yesterday, which was, um, which was a uh, nice thing for us to, to add. Um, so my name is Paul Dennison. Um, I'm a delivery lead at Seven Trent Water. Um, and the picture that you can see behind us there is, is one of the sites on the Elan Valley Aqueduct at Nampmel. Um, this was actually the downstream site which Ken, uh, who works for the B&M Alliance, will be talking through in a bit more detail um, as we move on. So the Elan Valley Aqueduct is affectionately abbreviated to the EVA, so uh, we will be referring to it as the, as the EVA as we go through, just, just to make reference on that. So, so just to give a, a bit of an overview, I'm going to present um, a, a bit of the history of the EVA, give you a bit of an outline of, of why it's so important to Seven Trent Water, give some uh, general facts, um, and then Ken's going to run you through the three, uh, the three tunnelling schemes that we've got at Bledford, Nampmel, and Fridwood. Um, I'll give you an overview of cost and programme at the end, um, just so we're completely transparent on that, and we'll finish with, a, with an overview video that we've got um, that just gives us a good summation of, of the work we've done to date and gives you some good time-lapse footage of, uh, of the tunnel and, and the breakouts that we've done on the EVA as well. So, just before we, uh, just before we kind of crack into it, th this, this was a uh, statement written by Thomas Barclay back in the 1890s at the time when we were looking at feasibility work um, and obviously how we would create a sustainable uh, water supply to Birmingham. And I think this, this statement by Thomas Barclay resonates particularly well with water companies, particularly because this is the mantra that we still work and operate under. So perhaps the heaviest responsibility resting on any local government is the establishment and maintenance of a proper supply of water for the use under its care. How unpardonable a failure in this all-important matter, yet how vast a task. So I'm sure if you were to ask every water company who's just submitted their PR19 um, uh, submissions. This is, this is the, the main central focus of what we want to, to be achieving, obviously with the, with the lowest cost that we possibly can. Um, but but that, that's kind of true to, as true as it was in the 1890s as it is true today. So I think that's a really valid statement just to sort of open us up with. So, just to give a, a bit of a history on, on the EVA. So, they were constructed over, a, the, the EVA was, and the dam complex was constructed by the Birmingham City Corporation uh, over an 11 year period between 1893 and 1904. Uh, and I believe it was opened by King Edward um, at the time when, when it was first commissioned in 1904. It was needed and developed as Birmingham and the industrial kind of areas around Birmingham were rapidly expanding. Other uh, water uh, supplies, such as boreholes, etc., were looked into, but they were only seen as short-term solutions and not something that was sustainable for the future. So the Elan Valley Aqueduct was constructed, the EVA, uh, which brings water from the dam complex above Raida in central Wales down to, uh, frankly, water treatment works just outside Birmingham. And uh, a legacy of how, how successful that has been is that still 120, 130 years later, we're still using the aqueduct as one of our main uh, water supplies into Birmingham. So it is reputed to have cost around six million pounds um, at its time of its construction and employed around 50,000 men. Um, the aqueduct is about 119 kilometers long and it runs from the four tower up at the Elan Dam complex down to the Frankly treatment works just outside Birmingham. It is a brilliant design um, that uh, delivers water at about a constant two miles an hour down the whole length of the aqueduct. 
It's 119 kilometers long, but the fall from one end to the other is only 52 meters. So to give you an idea, that is unbelievable precision engineering over 119 kilometers that was done by the Victorians. Um, I think we would probably struggle for that level of accuracy uh, today uh, across the same sort of distance. So it it's really was a brilliant undertaking by, um, by the Victorians. Um, the aqueduct is not a straight forward aqueduct, it consists of conduits, it's got tunnels, and the majority of its length is actually siphoned, because obviously the terrain that coming through Mid Wales, as we get down towards Birmingham, it's a very undulating, uh, very undulating landscape, um, and we're crossing many watercourses, uh, such as the river, such as the River Severn, for example. So this just, uh, this just shows you one of the uh, tunnels that was constructed. So this would, have been, this would have been constructed by old mining techniques, so dynamite, blast out, etc. We always are, are, are amused by the, um, by the very dapper gentleman on the, uh, the right-hand side there, uh, who we assume is the supervising engineer. Um, um, but, the, uh, but, but we've got lots of sections that are constructed on the EVA like this. And... The strength that was actually put into to the construction of them was really quite unbelievable. And as Ken talks through later about how we had to break out the existing aqueduct, one of these sections, we had a, we had a pecker on it for about several hours, and we, we probably got a hole about that big in the side of the, uh, the aqueduct structure. So it's, uh, it's an unbelievably well-built um, well aqueduct. This is uh, uh, the conduit section at Bledford. Um, so this was done by open cut. Um, so what we've got here is we've got brick lined concrete. Um, so that's the brick lining that's gone in uh, with the concrete behind. Obviously we've got the uh, shuttering at the top. Um, the precision of this brickwork is unbelievable. And the pointing that is on that, that brickwork is unbelievable. When we go into the aqueduct today and we have a look at that, it is still phenomenal. It, it, it's perfectly laid out. Modern, modern housing um, is, is really no, no, um, no scratch on that, quite frankly. It, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and this is, this is the, uh, these are the dams that are being constructed, uh, were constructed, sorry, in the 1890s. So this is, this is the lower dam here. So we've got a series of three dams on the uh, Ellen Valley, um, and these were constructed across that 11-year period. The infrastructure that was needed to, uh, to construct these was unbelievable. So we can see we've got temporary, uh, we've got temporary train tracks that were put in. Um, and along the whole route of the EVA, we had sort of small kind of um, uh, settlements that were popping up as the aqueduct was being built along its length. But really a, a phenomenal undertaking to, to construct the dams and the whole aqueduct across that 11-year period. So this is the foil tower. And this is, on the, um, this is on the lower dam of the Elan complex. So this is actually the start of the EVA. So this is, this is the extraction point um, where, the, where the water enters. Uh, the treatment works up at Elan and then obviously starts its uh, long 120 kilometer journey down towards Birmingham. Um, and if you've ever driven through Mid Wales, you may have seen these structures that are perched on the hillside. So these are the well houses. These sit either end of the siphon pipes. And the well houses serve a very important function for the siphons. They allow um, air to move in and out of the siphon pipes so we don't develop uh, uh, excess negative or positive pressures within the siphon. But they also contain slam shut valves as well. So if we were to ever have a collapse or a or burst on the siphons, we can protect that area by uh, closing the slam shuts. Um, all of these well houses have overflows to receiving water courses as well, which we can safely dissipate the water in, in those kind of occurrences. And this just, gives you a, this just gives you a general overview of what we've just talked about. So it, it, it flows for 119 kilometers, originally commissioned in 1904. It takes around two days for the water to come down the, the entire length of the aqueduct. Um, and it uh, discharges into, frankly, water treatment works just on the outskirts of Birmingham. It is a raw water aqueduct. The water is only treated. It's got a slight bit of pH balancing that takes place up at Elan. Um, but then as it comes down, it is raw water, and it's treated then at Frankly before it's then distributed to our to our customers. Um, it's been in service for about 100 years, well, well over 100 years now, so um, obviously it's important that we, we look after that. And as I say, the, the net drop is around 52 meters from one end to the other. This just gives you a, um, this just gives you a rough plan of, of, the, of the line of the aqueduct. So it, it starts up in, uh, just above the radar in the Yellan complex flows through these locations and uh, finally discharges at frankly water treatment works. 
For obvious reasons, we can't show you too much detail about the pipeline routes because it is national infrastructure. So that just gives you a vague, vague overview of, of where we um, where we've uh, where the uh, aqueduct uh, flows. And then this this is the difference across the across the aqueduct. So we're made up of tunnels. We're made up of conduits. Uh, and the majority of the aqueduct itself is actually made up of siphon pipes. Um, and we have uh, some beautiful masonry crossings and pipe bridges that exist along the length. Um, so it really is a, a very varied structure from, from one end to the other. Um, as you're sort of up more in the Welsh area, you'll find that it's majority of tunnels and conduits. As you come down to sort of into England, there's more siphon pipes, um, just purely because of the nature of the, of the ground. So that just gives a that just gives a bit of an overview as to um, the the what the aqueduct is. So it's really just contexting why we Seven Trent with our partners of the BNM Alliance are actually investing in the aqueduct across Amp Six. So obviously we've inherited this beautiful aqueduct that was constructed by the Victorians. Um, part of our role, obviously, is to make sure that we preserve the aqueduct. It's 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 got to be there for future generations, um, and we've obviously got to make sure that um, that we uh, that we make you know it, we preserve the water supply that's, that's coming through to Birmingham. So it really fits in with our core values about protecting our customers' needs. So the reason we're investing is that across uh, Amp Five. Uh, when we do our routine inspections, which we do every five to ten years, um, we noticed that some of the sections were starting to show signs of cracking. Um, so it's not acceptable for us to, uh, in that case, to just wait until something was to fail and us to conduct a repair. This is obviously an important uh, raw water pipeline for us. We need to proactively invest um, and make sure that we're looking after that pipeline. So three sections were identified for, it, for investment, and that was at Bledford, Fridwood, and Nantmel, which Ken will be talking about shortly. Um, uh, but the main reason we had to do these offline replacements with these tunnels um, is because the aqueduct itself can only be turned off for a short period of time. So it brings water down from the Welsh uh, central Wales, obviously, into Birmingham. We can't turn the aqueduct off for long durations that allow us to conduct in, in uh, pipe repairs. So we have to replace the sections that were showing signs of a deterioration. So in total, we're laying a, we've, we've laid already to date um, almost four kilometers, I believe, four and a half kilometers, but we've got about 4.6 kilometers of new tunnel that have been constructed, all of the same diameter, all using the same tunnel boring machine that we've changed from each location as we've gone through the program. And then just back to that graphic, that just shows you where the three, um, the three sites are. So Nampmelt is closest to, to the Elan complex. We've then got uh, Bledford, and we've then got the last tunnel, which is the one that we're currently tunneling at the moment, which is in Knighton, or affectionately called Fridwood. So I'll hand over to Ken now, who will just run you through a bit of the detail. Thanks, Paul. Um, I suppose just before we go into the, the, the detail, um, originally the, the project was going to be laid under three separate contracts. Uh, so the, the, the tunneling uh, schemes were going to be laid under separate contracts. We um, convinced Seven Trent that to, to let it as a batch would uh, offer more efficiency. Also gave us the opportunity to learn between the, the, the projects so that we could standardise design and improve the design and make it more efficient. <clears throat> Part of that was the tunnel boring machine. Um, obviously. If we've got three projects to go at, it becomes more an efficient um, way of buying the machine rather than having to hire it on three separate uh, occasions. So the first scheme bled for, um, when, even when we were in the tender stage, we knew it was a very tight deadline. Um, the ODI date for Seven Trend for Bledford was the tightest out of the, the three. Um, so we, with Seven Trend, had to come up with a kind of a cunning plan of how to accelerate the programme before we even started. So what we did was, um, because there was a kind of um, a vagueness, I guess, about the, the tunnel design, so we had a, a minimum um, diameter of tunnel.
the, the only sort of thing we had to do, obviously, um, because we'd already got the machine to basically dig a hole big enough uh, for what we needed, we then had to sort of back design the, the, the segments. So we went to McCann's um, and again asked what they had uh, mould-wise that was roughly, <laughs> roughly about right. Um, and they had a mould that they could adapt. They, they thickened the segments that they had and, and we ended up with a, a 3.05 internal diameter. And I think the minimum was a, a 2.8. So again, 7 Trent got that benefit free of charge. So just going on to the detail of the, the projects themselves, um, Bledfer, as I say, was the, the first uh, project. Um, now, the driver for Bledfer uh, was obviously, as you can see, there's a bit of deterioration in the, the soffit. Um, I told, uh, Paul sort of touched on it briefly. The, the, the sections of the um, EVA are built separately, so that you've got the there's tunnel sections, and then when it's shallow enough, they, they went to open cut. Um, so the, the bit with the deterioration at Bledfer is at an open cut section. So what we had to do then was we had to dig down and, and um, connect onto a sound section of the EVA, both ends obviously. Um, so we actually connected onto a tunnel section in the upstream and then a, 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 an open cut section on the downstream. So that, that's kind of where we got to. Um, I, I suppose historically I was involved with quite a lot of the feasibility uh, of these schemes. Um, and there's a whole host of options around this, whether it was to replace it um, through a pipeline and put another siphon in, etc., etc. But it kept coming back to the fact that the Victorians had the best idea, so let's just stick with that. <laughs> so this is the, the Bledfer site. Um, so initially, um, we got a kind of scoping design from Seven Trent Water, um, and that showed us with a separate launch and reception shafts and then a separate shaft for connection. So in the detailed design phase, we obviously designed that out, um, and we designed a, um, a coffer dam, which incorporated both the, the launch and the uh, connection. So as you see in the, uh, the bottom left, that's the uh, launch and connection coffer dam, and then the line, let's see if I can work this thing. This here is the existing EVA. Now, what we had to do was we had to put a, um, a reinforced wrap around it, which I'll, I'll describe in a second. Um, and that, that then, well, that's the, the, the angle of the, the connection. So hydraulically, we had to meet it at 15 degrees. Um, otherwise, as Paul says, it's such a shallow gradient. We didn't want to um, cause any hydraulic uh, restrictions uh, by a greater angle than that. So we had to uh, angle it at 15 degrees and keep it there. So I've just uh, lost my notes here. Very good problem. <clears throat> yeah. So um, going back to the kind of the, the, the launch shaft. So the original uh, plan was to have a, a launch shaft across the, the road here, and then a connection shaft at this point here, and then obviously tunnel uh, two directions uh, back and, and forth. By doing this uh, way, we obviously minimised the, the amount of work we had to do to sink the shafts in the first place. Obviously, a massive uh, minimise of the environmental impact we had in that area. As you can see, it's uh, fairly pretty before we got there. Um, and also, obviously, the, the, the muck away and all that kind of stuff was much reduced, uh, which I'll, I'll go into in a bit as well. So the coffer dam itself is obviously seeking piled. Um, the top half of the... Because, because this, this basically, the, the tunnel comes through the hill and it, it stops about here, and it's a culvert section that runs out here. So if you can imagine, this area here is a, an awful lot higher than there, so it sort of slopes right down. So where our coffer dam is, there's a kind of sloping bedrock in the, in the bottom of the coffer dam. Um, so we obviously had to pile down into the bedrock and then break out the, the rock to get into the, the EVA. And that, that was a, a kind of tricky bit, because uh, obviously we were breaking out rock, but we were conscious that the EVA was of almost encased in this rock that we were breaking out, so we had to proceed with caution. The only difference is over the um, EVA itself, you'll see there's sheet piles there. Um, so what we did there is as we dug down, we, we pushed them down with us. Um, so obviously we didn't want to get any uh, or close to the EVA uh, during that process. So this is um, basically going on to the monitoring. Um, so um, we had to install this prior to any work starting around the EVA. So as you can see, that's the, the outline of the, the coffer dam. Um, and we couldn't get anywhere near the EVA unless we could prove our works weren't affecting it. Um, so 
the shutdown prior to us actually getting to site, we had to set this, this system up. Uh, and it basically it was a real-time uh, monitoring, um, which was vibration, crack, and also shape um, arrays, which Gary's in the, in the house somewhere. Um, we, he helped us out on that one. Um, so real-time monitoring, uh, and that's the shape arrays. So that's sort of mid-install. Um, so we had, a, I think it was six um, horseshoe um, shape arrays, and then there was a one right along the crown. So we knew exactly what was happening in, in real time. A, 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 a little aside, we, we did the same thing at Nantmel um, <clears throat> before we got to Nantmel. So again, the shutdown before we started work um, and probably about two months after we'd installed it, there was alarms started going off uh, for the movement at Nantmel and we were nowhere near it. And it just shows how much this actually moves, but nobody knew about it until we, we started monitoring it. So we obviously had alarm, um, amber and, and red alarms, um, and we had not only had email alerts sent out, we, we set up beacons on the, uh, the site itself so that lads could see uh, if they got too close to the EVA and we got any alarms, there was a big flashing orange beacon so they, they stopped work immediately. And that's just a kind of output of what you can see when you look, we'll log on to the website, that gives you the detail of every node and, and how uh, much it's moving in a kind of three-dimensional uh, way. So going back to the detail um, of Bledfer, um, now, as I said before, we're, we're very conscious of the uh, structure of the EVA and how we are going to affect it with our works. Um, as you can see, uh, again, here and here, that's the existing EVA. Um, so as we dug down the, the coffer dam, we had to put this wrap um, as a kind of reinforced concrete wrap. Two metre sections, so that was all done as a kind of hit and miss. So if you imagine us digging down individually and doing those two metre sections, it looks a little bit rough, <laughs> uh, but I suppose the, the term is fit for purpose um, because it was very difficult, obviously, trying to dig down two metre sections and get a nice smooth uh, concrete finish on there. The other thing we had to watch, obviously, because again, as I say, the the angle of the connection is only 15 degrees, so the, the launch eye there is very close to the existing, and obviously any reaction from the, the launch uh, shove frame was going to go straight back onto the EVA, which we, we couldn't afford to happen. So you can see it's quite a beefy big shove frame, uh, which is anchored down into the concrete. We actually had to dig down the rock about a metre and a half, two metres, to key it into the rock to stop any uh, forces being pushed back onto the EVA. Um, so there's a lot of heavy um, temporary works been done uh, to prevent any uh, impact on the EVA itself. On the downstream, um, I wouldn't say it was easier, uh, but uh, it was different. Um, so again, everywhere you go, the bled for upstream that we just looked at was probably the flattest site we've had. Um, it just got gradually worse from that point onwards, uh, or more challenging, shall we say. Um, this is the downstream side. So we've got a big sloping field um, and we needed to create our work platform. Obviously you can just see that's the existing EVA at the top. So again, we've already done the concrete wrap there. Um, so we had to do our, uh, our platforms. So we looked at various options. There was uh, obviously sheet piling, uh, secant piling, doing a kind of big wall along here or uh, concrete retaining slabs, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we settled on this solution, uh, which is a very environmentally friendly solution. So it's basically a geotextile wrap, um, sort of earth reinforced soil wall. This one's 89 degrees. It's a, I think it was 120 meters long and about 12 meters high. And when we built it, it was the, the biggest in the UK, if not Europe. Um, and now we've stripped it all back down again. <laughs> uh, but there we go. Um, very good, uh, thoroughly um, impressed by the, the way we did that, and um, it was a, a great um, solution to the, the problem that we had there. Um, so go back to Bledfer, um, again, we've got the, the launch pit there um, and the, the existing um, EVA. Um, what we did, uh, we, we obviously had to connect into the uh, existing EVA, both sides, um, and part of the kind of tender, um, we had to come up with a, an innovative design of how to turn the flows live. 
The big problem we've got is that the EVA can only be shut down twice a year. Um, March and October, we've just, just gone one past, uh, which was somewhat stressful, but we'll leave that there. Um, so we had to kind of come up with a way of turning the flows live so we didn't have to depend on these um, uh, shutdowns. So we came up with this kind of diversion block system. Uh, and to do that, which I'll show you in, in a second, we had to create this kind of Y branch uh, onto the EVA. So this, the two pictures on the right is actually during a shutdown. Uh, so that's the existing EVA. The flow would obviously normally come through here and through here. So this is the upstream, that's the downstream. Um, so the flow would normally travel down through this route here, and we've formed this Y branch, if you like. It's a bit of a V at the moment, but it'll become a Y. Um, so we designed that so that we could do the maximum amount of work outside the shutdowns. Um, so we, again, designed it so that we could incorporate the uh, reinforced wrap into the overall design so that we could tie in uh, the wing walls and everything uh, like that, get that all complete before the actual shutdown itself. And then during the shutdown, all we had to do all uh, was to basically break out this section of the EVA and that, that would then form the, the, the connection that we could um, then do the diversion. So I'm hoping that the next slide should show you what, exactly what we did during the shutdown. That's us taking off the reinforced wrap. That's exposing the actual EVA there. This is the bit Paul was talking about. That hole took us four hours to break out. You see these guide rails, that was to help the diversion blocks when we dropped them in. And then we had to set up the, the pit bottom again to start tunnelling, because we had to stop tunnelling while we were doing that. Excuse the uh, self-promotion there. <laughs> so, that gives you an idea of what we had to do in the 72-hour window. Um, Obviously, it's quite a lot of work, um, but we, we did it. Um, first time round, I think everybody was a bit concerned. Um, not me, obviously. Uh, but um, I think uh, Paul had a few sleepless nights <laughs> before and during, um, but we got there. Um, and I think we proved our design works, um, and it has been working. So th this is falling on from that. Um, you can see, obviously, the live flows there. Um, so what we did, um, we basically took the roof slabs off um, a section at a time and then drop these blocks in. So this is the design up the top here. Uh, so we dropped them in one at a time to crank them through. Before we did that, we had to take the stop logs. So we'd stop logs here, just on the end there, to stop the flows going into the, the tunnel. So we took them out and let the, the flow stabilise between the, the old and the new. And once that was stabilised, we then started on the upstream, put these blocks in, and then went to downstream and did the reverse, which this is the, the downstream. And it worked uh, really well. Um, and obviously in the shutdown, we had to then go back in and then just isolate that old section there. Um, but yeah, credit to the team. It was a, a big bit of effort, but we, we did it. And we proved it worked. So when we moved on to Nantmel, uh, we did the same sort of thing. Um, and um, the client obviously had the confidence uh, uh, that we, it would work. So, um, obviously, that's what the tunnel looks like. <laughs> You've probably seen a few of them. Um, so, a smooth bore, um, so we don't have to do any more with the um, internals uh, there. Um, as it, each ring has six uh, trapezoidal segments in it. Uh, it's fibre reinforced generally, uh, and we'd steel reinforcement through certain areas. So, with high cover, low cover. Um, we'd also had to design for seismic activity because there's a few fault lines uh, through the area that we're, we're tunnelling through. Um, so again, there was some reinforcement uh, through there. Um, we 
also had to kind of standardise the gasket, so we standardised that for FID because we're like um, 100 metres deep in places, so we weren't altogether sure what the groundwater uh, pressure was like, so we standardised the, the gaskets for that, and then obviously that standardised the, the segment design, the only difference being uh, the, the reinforcement when we needed it. The quirky bit about the, um, the segment says they're 1.2 1 metres long, and that was a kind of cast over from the, the design from the, the TBM. Obviously, the Panama machine was designed on 1.2 segments, so we had to kind of basically adopt the same um, segment. Not a problem, really, with a, a few tweaks to do with the rolling stock and things like that, uh, but generally speaking, it wasn't, wasn't a big issue. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's about it, really, on the, the, the segments. <clears throat> This is obviously uh, just a, a snap um, of the, the first breakthrough. This is Bledfa. Um, we had, um, we're obviously turning in whales, um, and I suppose probably by luck rather than design that we had a lot of Welsh uh, miners, including our uh, tunnel superintendent, uh, Clive, who uh, sadly passed away. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> still affects me. <coughs> Um, but yeah, so he'd, he'd be proud of the, the achievement. <clears throat> so back to Bled, for obviously that's the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the reinforced soil slope. Um, that's as it was, obviously, which we, we saw before. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like now, that's it. So it's not quite fully greened up. It is now. This was a few months ago. Um, and that kind of leads on to the, kind of the, the reinstatement as a whole across the piece. Um, what we've tried to do is um, have a, a, a zero muck away, um, and to date, Touchwood, we've managed it. Um, we've done lots of different things to try and get rid of the, the muck, um, or should I say, reutilize the, uh, uh, the byproduct um, <clears throat> through the clear process. So we've, um, found various dips and hollows that the, the, the landowners and the farmers want to um, level out to give them more farmable land, so we, we've done it that way. We've also tried to regrade some of the rock that we've taken out of the tunnels and we've uh, graded it and made it a product rather than a waste. Um, so we've done all that work um, and, and so far, as I say, we've had uh, zero to, uh, to waste. That's it, just looking across the, the valley, obviously that's all greened up there now. Um, but you'd never know we were there, which is maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, I'm not, I'm not sure which. Uh, so no, moving on to Nant Mill, obviously the kind of detail is very similar, um, and I'll kind of show you some of the kind of the lessons learned that we, we, we did. Um, this again was designed with a separate uh, launch shaft and connection shaft, so I don't know if you can quite see that, uh, that's the new tunnel profile. So here and here there was supposed to be an extra shaft in there for, for launching and, and connecting. The horseshoe shape is basically because we are, one of the drivers of this job is to eliminate all the above ground structures. So Paul sort of showed you some nice pictures of the, the masonry crossings and, and that's one of the ones that, that we had to kind of bypass. There's nothing wrong with them at the moment. There's, you know, as Paul says, you walk through them and they're perfect, but they're obviously over 100 years old um, and at some point they'll need a bit of work. These are all listed structures, um, so it's not a case of just slapping a bit of concrete on and reinforcing it. You would need to go through all that process because it is a listed structure. So that would be a huge investment. Um, so that's one of the drivers for, for this job is trying to eliminate them. And obviously, the, um, because there's a, a quite a few above ground structures and the fact that this um, section of the EVA was almost built on the surface and then backfilled over, as you drive along, you can just see that a, a nice smooth field and then this, this hump, and that's the, the EVA. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get away with that these days, but um, the Victorians had a, had a way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we've got to basically dive into the hill and then come back out again, hence the, hence the, big, the big curve. Uh, so that gives you a, kind of, a, an isometric view of it, I guess. So the, the purple there is the existing, and the green is the, the, the new. So again, you'll see um, a launch, launch and, uh, or sorry, this is a reception, uh, reception and connection pit. We've just broken through there, actually. You can just see the head of the machine. Um, because it's virtually on the surface, we didn't need a coffer dam this time, and we had enough room to batter it back. So we basically just battered this section back, 
uh, there's a bit of a reinforced soil slope down here because this is the village of Nantmel, all, all eight houses of it. Um, so we, we got away with just doing that on the surface, so we didn't actually need a, a, a coffer dam as such on, on this side. This is the, one of our favourite pictures. You might have noticed that we, you've seen it a few times now. Uh, and again, this is the EVA up here. So you can see roughly what I mean. That's this, the, the original slope. And then this hump is the existing EVA. I don't know if you can just see that, but that's it exposed and that's got the concrete wrap around it and then it continues off down, down there. So we're connecting on this side, which wasn't the most convenient. So we had to crane everything up and over the top of the, the EVA. Um, and then that launch pit there, which I'll just show you now. Yeah, it's not great, but anyway, uh, which is up here. So again, if I just go back a bit, you can see the profile. That's the original profile of the field. Um, we've had to kind of cut a couple of platforms in there. So one here, one here. So there's a couple of reinforced soil slopes, one there and one there, and a bit of an alpine road to get up to the top here. So. One, I mean, it's probably obvious, but it's, uh, one of the biggest challenges we've had is the topography of all these schemes and how we lay out our sites. So there's no standard layout of the site. Um, so each one's got its different uh, quirkiness. Um, so the storage area is here and here, and then we to tra travel the segments up and round the road, that kind of thing, because the Arctic's wouldn't get up the top. So we to drop the, the segments here and then bring them, bring them up. Fidwood is the, or Frithwood, should I say. Um, this is the current scheme. Um, so we've got about 200 and odd metres to go. Um, it's been the most challenging, which we always knew it would be. Um, it's got a, a different, um, it's diff different in the, its complexity. Um, we've basically got a uh, launch, well, there's a connection shaft here. There's a drop shaft just beside it. And then it's a siphon tunnel to a new well house, which we're building on, on this side. Uh, again, slightly different drivers for this one, but similar, if that makes sense. So we're, we're trying to get rid of the above ground structures here. So there's a masonry crossing right beside us here. So there's quite a deep uh, brook that runs through here. Um, and, and there's a masonry crossing here, a retaining wall, another masonry crossing, and another one here. Um, so basically what we had to do, and again I'll show you photos of the profile of, of, the, of the land, we had to kind of dive down under the brook and then come back up to the, the well house. So we had a kind of connection shaft um, at the top, at the level of the EVA. That then was a high level tunnel across to drop shaft, 32 metres down, and then underneath the brook and then we climbed gradually in a siphon tunnel back up to the well house. So that's the, that, that's, this is a while ago, obviously we've, we've progressed it since then, but this is a, us just trying to get in to start the, um, the shaft construction. So you can see the kind of profile of the ground and this, this ran all the way around here. Um, this was the steepest site uh, we had. That's a kind of longer shot of it. Uh, so you can see this is the main road. So that basically links uh, the middle of Wales uh, with the rest of the world. <laughs> Um, so we had to look after that, um, so much so that we had this soil nailed wall that we had to put in, and there's about a 16 metre long soil nails holding that face up to protect that road, and the drop shaft sat in here, connection shaft was over, or is over in the corner here. Um, so again, that, that's a kind of um, an idea of what we had to do. This is very tight up here. So we had to build, this, this is the start of us building the, the haul road, and it's a, a kilometre long haul road that takes us down to the main compound. So again, everything's delivered at the bottom of the, the compound and then shipped up. Uh, we actually tarmacked this road because it's a one in six gradient, um, and that was to give the, uh, the, the, uh, the lorries delivering the TBM enough traction to get up the hill. It's, not as steep, uh, sorry, it's, uh, this road's actually steeper, which I couldn't get my head around why we had to tarmac our road, but it's not as steep as that. But there you go. You've got to do what you've got to do. So this is the, obviously the, the drop shaft looking down and, uh, and up. Um, so we've got uh, second piles again. Um, you can just see that's the high level tunnel. So that's about 16 metres down from the, the surface. Uh, you can just see the top of it there. 
Uh, so these uh, piles are 25, 26 metres deep. Um, and then from that point onwards, we, we you can't quite see it on there, but we started um, digging out and shock treating because we're in the solid rock at that point. So the shaft is about 32 metres uh, um, depth in total. Um, and that's obviously deep enough to get us under the, the river and, and back up. Um, I mean, I didn't really kind of touch on uh, the kind of health and safety aspect of it much. I didn't kind of do a fancy slide on that, but we, we did a lot. Um, I mean, obviously we went back to the kind of shot of the, the lads coming out of the, the, the TBM. The, the, this team was developed uh, from scratch to deliver the, these projects. And we did a lot of um, safety initiatives um, from the start. We'd, um, we set up the training, um, uh, CITB training facility on site. We engaged with the HSE early doors uh, to get them in to have a look. We carried out various drills. We got the you know, fire brigade involved. I think they got too involved, to be honest. They wanted to use us as a training facility. But um, anyway, that's another story. Um, and so much so that we got, we got up to uh, just over 500,000 man hours free, which was just, just over a year. Uh, unfortunately, we had an accident uh, just after that. So we're, we're climbing back up again. Um, but you know some some of the, the stuff we did was was good, and uh, the lads really bought into it. Little things like um, we we gave awards, monthly awards, um, on and you know best safety performance and you know best innovation idea, and it could be simple little things like you know the, one of the lads had um, come up with this idea of a safety cabinet in the tunnel. So every every so often up the tunnel, there's a like a you open it up and there's a first aid kit and there's eye wash and there's various things in in this little metal box and um, just keeps it nice and clean and out of the way L little things like that which was great we also looked at um obviously we were five and two shifts uh, bled for we we started working 12 and twos because of the, the time scale um but we did a lot of work around the fatigue um uh, aspect of it because obviously a lot of lads are welsh they, they come from north wales so you're still talking about two hours uh, traveling so what we did, uh, we, we obviously sat down with them as well and, and uh, asked them what they wanted, um, which is dangerous, but there we go. Um, so we offered them kind of subsistence on, the, on a Friday night. So if they're on day shift, they could stay over on a Friday and travel up Saturday morning. Or likewise, they could come down on a Sunday, stay over Sunday night and then start on the Monday. We also did a lot of, um, uh, sort of downtime surveys. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the TBM um, I suppose time management um, to see what the lads were doing in a day. You know, because you've got a ring builder, he's not building rings all day. You've got a TBM driver, he's not driving the TBM all day. So in between times, you know, and, and when we actually worked it out, they were getting more rest than we are in the office. So you know, um, I, I think we managed that quite well. Um, and, and I suppose just a little uh, quirk, um, we, we kind of did all these sort of things, and, and we looked back to see the original scheme uh, and how, how they did. And we did try to find um, safety records for the, the original project. And all we could really find was a statement that said infrequent deaths. So I don't know if that was them saying it was a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, um, what they did do, um, and we've, we've got this old book, which is fantastic, but it doesn't sort of replicate very well. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, rules and regulations. <clears throat> so as Paul was ta talked about uh, earlier on there, um, they basically shift these little villages along with the, the, the tunnel. So they'd, um, obviously everybody stayed on site, they had the canteen, uh, they had you know a bar, they had um, everything there. They even had a jail um, at, at Bledford. Um, and there's a um, a good bit in it that's, um, I'll just read this, you need to excuse me for this, but um, it's rules for the keeper of the canteen. And this is um, written uh, from the RE. Um, I mean, there's, there's other things in there which you know I don't agree with, because at one point it says, women will not be permitted in the bar at all, without exception, uh, you know, and I thought, oh, a bit harsh. Um, but then, so, um, so we've got, um, this is just a, a little bit about the canteen and you know, talking about the welfare and the, the well-being of the lads and downtime and things like that. Um, and it, it says here, Amusements in the house are strictly prohibited. No music, singing, juggling, gambling, car playing, playing dice, dominoes, drafts, marbles, shovel penny, 
or any other game or skill of skill or chance will be permitted in the house. And I thought, bloody hell. <laughs> Change days, if you imagine doing that now. But um, anyway, that, that's me kind of um, done my little bit, and I'll just hand back to, to Paul. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. So, um, final few slides, and then we've, we've got a bit of an overview video just to finish on, which I think will context everything we've talked through uh, quite nicely. So, um, as Ken showed you on quite a few of the photos, we, we're working in pretty rural areas, and we're putting pretty major construction sites in pretty rural areas. Um, so, one of the things that we've had to work really closely with is, is our local communities, particularly for the eagle eyed amongst you will notice that all of this work is being done outside Seven Trent's region. It's all being done in Welsh Waters region. So we have to we have to treat the local communities that we're working exactly the same as we would if we were working in the centre of Birmingham or Nottingham or, or somewhere else within our within our patch. Um, we've worked really hard with, with local schools. So the local schools have all been involved in the uh, naming ceremonies of the TBMs. Um, at uh, Bledford, they called the TBM Mastermind, which uh, Mastermind, sorry, which I thought was was quite clever. Um, we we got progressively less adventurous as it went on. So at, at Nantmel, it became the Nantmel Super Mole, um, and uh, at Knighton, it was just called Offer because it crosses under Offer's Dyke uh, as part of the tunnelling scheme. Um, we had to throw out an awful lot of the entries that came in because it's clearly the artwork, especially clearly some of the parents had put some uh, double entendre in in the names that were coming through to us. So we had to um, uh, we had to throw those out um, um, because we didn't really want our name associated with that in the local press. Um, we, we've tried where we can to get um, uh, an involvement with, with local communities, so we've invited people up um, whenever we've launched the TBM, we've invited people up to, to see the TBM breakout. Um, we have done a lot of local sponsorship of things such as charities, uh, particularly where we're working in Knighton, we always try and sponsor the Knighton Carnival, which is something that they do on an annual basis. We're always open to the suggestion of, of getting involved with local events as well, um, and we've run customer exhibitions, presentations, etc. In the main, I think we've been fairly successful with, with our community engagement. I think there are one or two cases where we've learned lessons, and I think that's, that's an interesting thing that we can take, particularly if we're working outside Seven Trent's region. So, um, but, but, but absolutely as important to us as the client, if you like at Seven Trent, is how we deliver the project as well as the project being delivered. One of the things that I, I, I'm really proud of with working with B&M is their, is their commitment to local employment. So... Um, we have employed local uh, contractors uh, from based in uh, Clandrid Nod Wells. Um, we've also got a lot of our local workforce um, is, is actually from the Knighton area. It's not obviously, as you can probably imagine, rich with construction uh, work. So being able to offer that to the local communities has been fantastic. As well as that, we've been able to upskill local workforces as well. Um, uh, and something that shouldn't be overlooked is, as well as bringing jobs to the area, we, we forecast that we're probably bringing over £700,000 worth of, of um, revenue to local um, hoteliers, should we say, and B&Bs and businesses, because obviously we have, to, we have to house the workforce that we've got working on the project uh, across the years. And just to give you a perspective, this project originally started in 2015, and we are forecast to finish in October this year. So that gives you an idea that we've been running for four years. So our impact in the local community and how we've had to support the local community is really, really important to us. Now on to our cell, of course. Um, so we, we, we have been, we have been um, uh, quite successful in, in, in telling our story. So we, we've uh, won a number of awards uh, at uh, Civil Engineering Contractors Association, um, at uh, UKSTT, um, and the new Civil Engineer in December 2017. We've also had a number of Green Apple Awards, um, and we've also been on a number of BBC Midlands Inside Out programmes, and I think we may also be on an ITV programme that's going out later this year as well, um, that's, that's centred around sort of Seven Trent's operations. Um, we do continue to put to put awards in. Um, we've probably run our course with some of these um, with some of these uh, um, uh, awards, but but it's um, it's good to still get that out there and, and still obviously have a have a go at them. Um, so just really the final slide, um, just to give you an idea of program and cost. So 
Bledford was commissioned in March 2017, so that was at the final shutdown that we did for, for that, so that's where we turned the EVA, EVA off for a short period. So that was commissioned. We achieved our ODI date, which is our um, outcome delivery incentive um, um, uh, reward. Uh, NAMPMEL we commissioned in February uh, 18, which was um, over a year ahead of our, of our commissioning date. And NITEM we're looking at, that's the Fridwood Tunnel, we're looking at commissioning in October 19, which will be six months ahead of our scheduled program. So total final determination cost that we've got within our um, AMP6 business plan is 75.7 million um, associated with the project. And we are, if you're gonna ask me where we are performing against that, um, we are about performing on that number at this moment in time, which I think is really good going for the number of projects and length of time that this, this obviously has been, um, been running. So um, really good sort of success story as well as the engineering about how we're kind of trying to integrate with, uh, with the local communities. So I think we've got a final um, overview video that we'll just present to you. It lasts about four or five minutes um, and it just sums up hopefully everything that you've just heard here this evening. So thank you. Quite, not quite. <laughs> no. We're going to have another go at it. Might have to do a dance instead, Paul. <laughs> So it should, it should be on the um, flash deck. Okay. So maybe we won't see a video. <laughs> we've been, we've been. Uh, so it was on the flash deck on the laptop. Yeah. Okay. Well, should. Should we questions first? Yeah, we'll do, we do questions that, while, uh, we, yep, while yep. we're going on with that. What a fantastic project. Uh, so, questions and answers. Mike, uh, name and affiliation down at the front here. Tempe Works side, um, it's probably about the kind of 60% um, Tempe Works um, involved in the project. You saw the, the amount and volume uh, of the Tempe Works. And, and you're right, um, when we first took the tender on, we weren't 100% sure how we were going to do a few things. Um, we had a good idea, uh, but that obviously got developed along the line. So we started off with Bledford, which was a, a pretty much developed project. Um, then to Nantmel, which is a kind of semi uh, developed project, and then Fred, that was the one that was a kind of bit of a um, okay, let, let's leave that one until we've done Bledford and have a think about that one. Um, with regards to uh, risk, um, Seven Trend have very little. <laughs> um, it's, it's a design and build contract basically, so um, we are the design and build contractor. So we do the, the, the permanent design and the temporary design, uh, it's basically all on us. No saving they, they want a saving, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but you know, the, the, I mean, there's a pay and gain mechanism in the overall uh, uh, project cost, so there's a share there, um, but not not specifically for Tempe Box or anything like that. No. Uh, Rosa at the front here. Nice. Yeah, behind. So, oh, speak up, Rosa. Shout at us. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it's a kind of siltstone, um, different types of siltstone um, in varying degrees of strength. Obviously, Fred was the, the strongest stuff 
Um, I've got it actually written down here. It's a Silurian Ludlow series, if that may, means anything to you at all. Um, so we're basically uh, Nantmel and Bledfa. Um, we had no issues with the hard rock. Um, the, the, the bigger issues we had was with the soft rocks. Obviously, when we're going through kind of various fault lines, you get a kind of soft clay type uh, material where it's weathered. Um, and that kind of clogged up the head um, because it's a kind of mostly rock head. We got it clogged up, um, and that, that slowed down the production uh, bizarrely enough. Um, when we went to Frith, um, that is um, one of the biggest issues we've had to get going is the the hardness of the rock, and it's a solid rock. Um, so we've probably done about half to three quarters of the drive through um, solid rock with no. Um, uh, fissures or um, layers or anything, it's just been a mass. Um, so basically we're just grinding and grinding and grinding. That obviously has a big impact on the, the cutting discs, it cuts through it, um, but we're finding on uh, Fidwood that we've got to change the discs every week. Um, <coughs> now that we're kind of into the weathered rock, um, it's better in that respect. Um, but what we're getting is because it's um, not a regular face, we're getting discs impacting at different times as it's cutting. So you're getting the stresses on strains on different discs as it spins around. So we're having to change like two discs a week and then another two discs, discs the, the, the following week and, and that kind of thing. Again, we've gone through a couple of fault lines in uh, uh, Frithwood and that's when the soft stuff comes in and it basically just clogs up the face. So you're pushing right into the soft stuff. So all the foam ports and, and various things like that get blocked up because there's nothing holding it back. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the, the, some of the problems we've had. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, John Scully. It's not working, is it? No. Oh, it is. <laughs> I'm probably the only person who wouldn't need a mic in here because I'm a town crier. <laughs> John Scully, Jacobs, partly retired. Did you consider the use of a GRP single unit prefabricated on site bifurcation because that takes an awful lot of the risk out of what you have to squeeze into the 72 hours you're given to put the units in place. That's what we did at Studley Tunnel about uh, more five kilometers downstream of Ludlow and seven kilometers downstream of Ludlow back in the late 80s. Yeah, and, and funnily enough, we, we did study that one uh, when we were looking at the kind of um, design for the, the connection, and that was an option, to be fair. Um, we, I suppose because we, we had, um, we designed out the launch shaft, um, we didn't have that room, if you like, to do that. Uh, we also felt that the way we did it, it protected the, the EVA uh, as a whole, um, because we, we were obviously turning out the same pit, we didn't have that capability. Also, Seven Trent um, don't like GRP. <laughs> um, the, especially the ops guys that have got to do the, kind of, the walkthroughs, um, they tend to not like walking across wet GRP for some reason, I don't know why. Um, so yeah, so we were kind of steered away from it in, in, in two respects. But yeah, funnily enough, we did, we did study that at, at length before we started. That was a cracking scheme as well. <laughs> we'll see. Any more questions? Back. Oh, yeah, um, given that the aqueduct is 112 kilometres overall, uh, will there be sections in the future that need similar sort of uh, treatment or tunnelling? Uh, so, so from from the sort of survey work that we've done to date, those are the sections that we've had to look at. Most urgently, um, we, we do inspect every section of the aqueduct uh, at least once every five years, so we do have a roaming sort of section of surveys through it. Um, uh, we are doing a secondary project at the moment called Birmingham Resilience, which will allow us to um, take the aqueduct out of commission for a longer period of time. Um, um, so we would hope that if similar things were identified in the future, we could perhaps explore slightly more uh, efficient 
methods of repair that may be in line, etc. Um, but certainly at this moment, we've not identified anything on the scale of the three that we'd identified here that, that drove the investment to do the three tunnels. So it is, as I said in, in my kind of opening comments, for something that is 120 years old, built by the Victorians, it is unbelievably good condition structure along its whole length. Um, Shaney. Thanks. Uh, Shaney Wallace from Tunnel Talk. Um, you spoke of the health and safety uh, regime that was on site. Can you tell me what is the policy for taking mobile, personal mobile phones onto site? I was on a um, project in the United States last year where the contractor had banned all private mobile phones on site because they'd had two fatalities on two separate project sites associated with uh, people using their mobile phones. And so I just wondered whether that was part of the health and safety regime on the contract. Uh, partly, yes. I mean, uh, obviously, we don't allow any down in the tunnel. Um, obviously, any excavator driver or machine driver, plant driver, uh, they're not allowed to use mobile phones. We developed a kind of um, a safe zone, like, a, you know, like you would have a smoking zone, we had a phone zone. Um, that they could use their phones if, if need be. I mean, it's very difficult to stop everybody taking phones on site. One of the big problems we had, I suppose, on the, on the back of that was the social media aspect. Um, obviously, it's a nationally critical uh, asset, um, and the publicity around that, we don't want people taking snapshots of the, you know, the, the structure of the EVA and posting it on, yeah, you know what. Um, so yeah, we had to clamp down very much on that, um, and we did restrict it as much as we could, but it, it's difficult to put a blanket ban on it, to be honest. Any more questions? Let's see if we get the video working. Did we have any luck like, with the video? Oh, right, should we, should we, 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 oh, sorry, Mark, before we run the video then. Hi, Mark Leggett, Mark McDonald. A um, couple of questions, actually. The first one was, you abandoned some sections of the tunnel. What have you done with them? Have you backfilled them, or you kept them in situ? Or? So, so, the, so the tunnels at the moment have been filled in either end. Um, the tunnels uh, are being... Uh, we're keeping the tunnels drained, because obviously they are leaky, as yes. you, saw from the, uh, if you saw from the earlier photos. So we're keeping them drained at the moment, because we do still have liability over them. Over them. The bridge sections, um, um, or the masonry crossings, as we, we touched upon, are listed buildings, so they will remain anyway. Um, but we're not actually looking at infilling those existing tunnels at the moment, purely because it actually is quite a useful exercise size for us to have a, a, a safe area where we can do confined space training or to be honest with you when we're looking at inline repair techniques uh, maybe for other learning on the aqueduct we've got a great training environment that we can practice some of these products on so at the moment we haven't made a final decision about what to do with the existing tunnels yeah. but but we're keeping it open because we don't just want to abandon them for the moment it gives you an asset you've got to maintain, though, as well. It, it does give us an asset to maintain. Um, I mean, the fear is obviously if one of them was to collapse fully, um, you know, they're over two metre by two metre culvert, you'd probably take some land with it. But there's, you know, we've got farmland predominantly um, above it. Um, but we, we haven't made a decision yet to infill those or, or grout fill them, for example, at the moment. Okay, thank you. The other question I had was... The tunnels, do they run full? I mean, so obviously the siphon one must run full. Sy siphons obviously run full. Um, the, uh, EVA, the rest of the EVA does not operate under pressure, so right. it will, it's, it's gravity. So they will run probably at about four-fifths full um, for the majority of, of the flow, yeah. And the siphon, what concern? Did you have any concern? How did you deal with any concerns about um, pressurising and water leakage and all that stuff? In the design. You mean the, the new siphon? Yeah, the new siphon. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, that's obviously all part of the design. At one point, um, we were looking at a, a steel liner mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but uh, because of uh, the profile of the rock, we're going through solid rock. Yeah. We're grouting in behind. We're doing back grouting. You know, the water's not going to go anywhere. That's true. There's rocks. So there's no problem at all, is it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any, any more questions before we uh, go for the video? Okay, okay. Well, I must, must apologise. YouTube has clearly given us the gremlins tonight with presentations. <laughs> so. I'll see if it's the right video now. Our customers have an expectation that when they turn the taps on, 
there will be running water there. It's quite a challenge to make sure that that happens 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The legacy that the Victorians have left us here is wonderful. Moving water from Wales to the Midlands along the Helen Valley Aqueduct, a distance of 72 miles, you know, it was a phenomenal task. The people of Birmingham, they still depend on this particular source of water. But with 100 years comes wear and tear. The Allen Valley in Wales. Quiet countryside, rolling green hills. Not somewhere where you'd expect to find the main supply of water to the second largest city in the UK. Here, Seven Trent are investing over £75 million in their largest engineering project ever, the Ellen Valley Aqueduct Scheme. The Ellen Valley Aqueduct has been delivering clean water to homes and businesses for over 100 years. However, the need to maintain and refurbish the EVA is becoming more regular and so the time has come to provide some extra support. The reason we've been doing the work is to uh, lay a new tunnel adjacent to the existing aqueduct. The existing aqueduct at this location is showing signs of wear and deterioration. The aqueduct itself is now over 100 years old, um, so we're proactively investing to replace sections which are showing wear and tear. So this work is really important for our customers. It's about us maintaining a security of water supply through to Birmingham for the next 100 years. The aqueduct itself is, is approximately 75 miles long, flowing from Elan down to Birmingham. Um, and in order for us to, to preserve water supply, it's really important that we look after the, uh, the legacy that the Victorians left us. Work began on the project in October 2015, here in the town of Bledver in Mid Wales. Here, Seven Trent began construction of the first of three new water supply tunnels, which, when connected, will form bypasses of the existing aqueduct. At each end of the tunnel, Seven Trent has constructed a huge shaft. Been here now probably six months. We've finally got the bottom of the shaft excavated. We are in the process of doing the last lot of concreting at the base of the shaft, as you can see behind me. There's a steel frame in the base of the shaft, which you can see, square frame. That's what we're going to launch the tunnel machine off, which is arriving next Monday. This is Mastermind, Seven Trent's tunnel boring machine, whose name was chosen as part of a competition with the local school. And in May 2016, it began its 1.8 kilometre journey, watched by the group of keen onlookers. We are replacing sections of the Eland Valley Aqueduct it's a 100 year old structure and uh, some of the sections need repairing and that's why we're doing the offline uh, replacement. There's the three tunneling schemes, so this is the first of the three. Uh, obviously there's varying in length and this one's 1 1.8 kilometres, um, so we're about a third of the way through. The TBM will cover a total of five kilometres on this project, starting here in Bledford. The three tunneling schemes are very similar to each other meaning that they are offline replacements of the EVA, which will redirect the flow of water from the old systems to the new. One of the biggest challenges of the team is how to build the new connections onto the existing aqueduct. Work can only take place during planned shutdowns to the EVA. The shutdown can only last 72 hours due to storage levels at Frankly in Birmingham, but the team successfully completed both the upstream and downstream connections at Bledver in October 2016. It's an incredibly complicated and difficult operation. Construction has been managed by the joint forces of Barhale and North Midland Construction, who form the BNM Alliance. This consolidated way of working has proved invaluable to delivering an efficient way of working on the project to date. December 2016 marked a significant date for the project with Mastermind completing the first of three tunnels. We commenced the tunnelling work here uh, in May earlier this year. It's taken about six months for the first tunnel to come through to the event that we're at today. Um, but I'm really pleased to say that we are actually on target with the programme to make the new tunnel operational by the end of March next year. 
in order to receive the tunnel boring machine at the downstream end, we've had to build a 13 metre high retaining wall. That's to create a level platform for us to actually receive the machine and complete the tunnel. Once that's been completed, it's then taken three or four months for us to take that wall down and reinstate the field behind me back to its original condition. With two tunnels now complete and work about to start on a third, this is just the beginning of a monumental project that will improve the resilience and security of the water supply to Birmingham, ensuring that Seven Trent can continue to deliver over 300 million litres of water every day to millions of customers in the region. Um, so, um, if perhaps we could thank our speakers in the normal way and also thank Bar Hale for their largesse in sponsoring the bar. Um, <laughs> Um, but before you make the most of that sponsorship, I've got a few slides to go through, um, but I'll be quick. Um, BTS annual dinner, you know, Friday the 10th of May. Um, uh, tickets are selling out fast. Um, don't, be, uh, don't be left on the door without a ticket. Next slide, please. Um, for the young members, uh, young members conference here tomorrow. Um, uh, down, downstairs, 100 um, booked on for that. Next slide, please. Um, Thursday, the 4th of April, 19, uh, young members um, evening meeting, Ottawa Light Rail. The young members are very keen to stress that uh, their evening meetings are open to all, not um, just um, young members. Uh, even Martin Knights um, can, can, uh, is, is invited along. I understand you raise the question as to whether young, you could go along to young members, but all is open to all, Martin. So, uh, next, please. Um, Harding, uh, our next meeting, Thursday the 18th of um, April, um, our Harding Prize um, uh, 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 winners um, giving their presentations. Next, please. Um, and then our AGM on Thursday the 16th of May um, The uh, uh, will be... Uh, talk about um, Brunel's museum and um, the drawings that have been recently purchased um, in, uh, indicating the construction. So a, 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 good, a good talk to go to there. Next, please. Um, tunnel surveying workshop, um, 16th of May, um, young members. Next, please. Uh, and the 6th of June, uh, BTS young members evening meeting, ground movement due to circular Shaft construction in London Clay, the ICE. Next, please. Our design construction course, um, beginning to uh, draw in um, numbers now. Um, the early part of the summer, um, booking uh, is open. Um, it's a bargain of a course, and um, everybody who goes along comes away saying they've enjoyed it very much. So um, if you've got anybody, if you want to go or you know anybody who should go, do point them in the direction of this course. It's an excellent value. Next, please. Um, a few uh, BGA um, meetings. Um, the, the Rankin <coughs> Lecture on the 29th of March, um, BGA uh, evening meeting on the 10th of April um, uh, on, on monitoring. Um, next, please. Um, a BGA conference, Piling um, 2020. Um, it will be held 15th and 16th of September. Um, if you have a paper, um, abstracts have got to be in by 30th of April. Next, please. Um, there is a, uh, a one-day seminar um, introduced, uh, uh, being provided by the Institution of Mining and Murphy on uh, the morning of the 4th of April 2019. And there are flyers available for that outside if you want to read more about it. One final slide. Um, Tideway. Um, you, all members are invited to the ICE Tideway Technical Conference to be held here on Thursday the 28th of March 2019 from 8.30 um, to 6.30 in the evening. Um, thank you. Um, the bar is open. <laughs>